Um, good day. So I want to thank the organizers for inviting me and uh, to anointing me as the uh, inaugural uh, Rick McDermott lecture. And um, here we go. So uh, the title of my uh, lecture that I was assigned was The Environment and IBD, What Every Patient Asks and Every Clinician Should Know. So let's start with the worldwide epidemiology, and you can see on this uh, uh, map that you've seen perhaps in uh, Sue Wang's paper in The Lancet, that the red spots around the world in North America, Northern Europe, and Australia, New Zealand are the hot spots of high incidence of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but in fact, worldwide, IBD has emerged and there are increasingly hot spots emerging. You can see, in, not quite in red, but in orange, spots in Africa and in India where uh, IBD seems to be booming. And when considering the epidemiology of IBD and trying to understand potential uh, etiologic factors, I think that it's, uh, it's interesting to consider that IBD that presents in Orlando and Winnipeg and New York and Paris and Mumbai and Delhi pretty much all looks the same. And it really makes me want to believe that we should therefore be looking for some unifying factor that ex or factors that exist around the world. We know that we're all genetically different around the world. We know that we're going to have different gut microbiota around the world. We have different diets in, in general around the world. But we have the same type of IBD that presents, and there's probably clues in there for unifying factors that exist around the world. The, um, the other thing to consider as we move through this talk is the gut microbiome. We've heard lots about it, a great talk by one of our leaders in North America, Gene Chang, yesterday, and other allusions to the gut microbiota. And in this cartoon from Gerald Tannock from a long time ago, just to remind everybody that our gut microbiome develops in the first year of life. And as you see the different colors emerging from uh, childbirth over to one year of age, there is a vulnerability of the infant's gut microbiota that can be um, changed by whatever happens to that infant in the first year of life and may be changed in a way that becomes permanent. And the gut microbiota impacts on the uh, gastrointestinal immune response. And ultimately, uh, that child's risk for developing chronic immune diseases, including IBD. So let's start with the classic environmental factor that we all like to talk about, which is smoking. And this is just one of many slides from uh, either Europe or North America that we could show that um, Crohn's disease patients are more likely to be smokers, ulcerative colitis patients are more likely to be ex-smokers, so they've smoked at one time, and that if Crohn's disease patients are smoking, it's going to have a bad course on their disease. And I've never really thought that smoking was a real cause of Crohn's disease. I wondered whether smoking's effect had, was on, on, a, on the vasculature and impacted on the way Crohn's disease behaved once it existed, um, or whether now to consider the gut microbiome, whether smoking has an impact on the gut microbiota. But what's turned me off about smoking uh, lately, although I still want all my patients with Crohn's disease to quit, is that smoking does not seem to be a risk factor at all in the developing world where IBD is really emerging. In fact, amongst the highest incidence, or the, the rate of rise of incidence is highest in places like India and China, compared to in Canada, for instance, the incidence has plateaued. The incidence is still higher per 100,000 in Canada than in India, but the rate of rise has plateaued. So here in this paper from uh, New Delhi, 20% uh, were oral tobacco users or smokers amongst this cohort with Crohn's disease, but there was no impact of oral tobacco or smoking on disease course. And in this uh, comparative study between China and India, which were in-person cohorts versus an American survey study that's a little bit complicated, but nonetheless you can see with the Chinese and Indian data that current smoking was not a risk factor at all for presenting with Crohn's disease compared to the general population, although ex-smoking in China was for ulcerative colitis. So I do still uh, recommend that patients with Crohn's disease quit smoking, and I think smoking is bad for you in general. We should all quit smoking for all kinds of reasons. I'm not sure that smoking is an etiologic factor in IBD worldwide. So what about antibiotics, one of my favorite topics? I'm a bit of an 
antibiotic nihilist. You can see here in this slide of antibiotic use around the world in red, which is the color of our flag in Canada, you see the, uh, Canada's use of antibiotics. And while Canada has amongst the highest incidence rates of IBD in the world, uh, we're not necessarily the leaders in antibiotic use, and you can see on the far right, countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, Greece, South Korea, China, have much higher use of antibiotics. And one of the difficulties in tracking antibiotic use in uh, emerging countries is that they can even be purchased without prescriptions. I mean, we can track it with administrative data in Canada, can't be tracked that way in places like China where you can buy it at a corner store. Well, we all know what this is a picture of. This is a picture of Clostridium difficile, and this is a model where antibiotics clearly have uh, triggered a form of colitis, a reversible form of colitis, but nonetheless a form of colitis uh, that we are quite familiar with. And we're also familiar with the fact that when we give people antibiotics, they emerge with fungal infections. Um, and in fact, in this, uh, one of the first studies looking at the fecal fungome from the French group from uh, Henry Sokol, uh, Sokol uh, you can see here there are changes in the uh, fecal fungome amongst patients with IBD, and interestingly, changes in Saccharomyces, an organism to which Crohn's disease patients mount an antibody response that we know is an interesting marker that Crohn's disease may be present, but we don't understand that it has any pathogenetic significance. And this is a really uh, interesting paper by Givers uh, that was published a few years ago looking at a large cohort of about 400 kids and looking in their stool and mucosally in their rectum and in their terminal ileum at certain uh, species of organisms, and in this case genera, uh, and showing the gains and the reductions in the first panel on the left uh, in different areas of their bowel or stool between patients with Crohn's disease and healthy controls. And in the right-hand panels, what you see is after the administration of antibiotics, all hell breaks loose in terms of what happens with the microbiota, either in the stool, in the uh, rectum, or in the terminal ileum. And in fact, David Relman's group at Stanford has done some interesting antibiotic studies to show that the changes that we see are actually quite prolonged. They can last for months, even. So we're in our, this audience addicted to Cipro and Flagyl, uh, mostly uh, not with a clear evidence base for our use for them, but we use them nonetheless. And in fact, the administration of Cipro can change one's microbiota for several months. Now, this is a really uh, important and um, I would actually say stunning uh, paper that was published in JAMA a few years ago. And this used the National Ambulatory Medical Care Survey and National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey and sampled 184,000 visits in the United States. 12.6% resulted in antibiotic prescriptions, mostly for upper respiratory tract reasons. Collectively, amongst the acute respiratory conditions, 20% um, of uh, visits ended up with prescriptions, half of which were considered inappropriate. I've listed half here as being appropriate, which means half were inappropriate. And you can see on the bottom two lines that one-third of all prescriptions were considered to be inappropriate, inappropriate antibiotic prescriptions. So we really have to be mindful of this because um, our first tenant in our is primum non nocere. So we need to know what we're doing with uh, our antibiotic uh, prescriptions. And we don't know what harm we're doing. It, we do know we can get patients out of the office faster by giving them an antibiotic prescription, but we're not necessarily helping them. So we were interested in this concept, and we have a population-based database in Manitoba. Surade Shaw was a doctoral student when he put these data together. We have population-based prescription data going back to 1995, and we did the study up to 2008. So we were looking at kids versus, with IBD versus controls and looked at their use of antibiotics in the first year of life when their gut microbiota were vulnerable. And what did we find? We found that 60% of kids with Crohn's disease had at least one antibiotic dispensation in their first year of life compared to 40% of controls, more diagnosed with Crohn's disease than UC, and this translated to an odds ratio of threefold of kids with IBD actually getting antibiotics early in life, in the first year of life, than controls. And Ryan Ungaro at Mount Sinai put together this meta-analysis, 
where um, he showed that there is really consistency of the data and overall a 40%, sorry, an, uh, yeah, 40% increased risk, an 80% increased risk, I'm sorry, of antibiotics uh, and the ultimate development of childhood IBD. Now this is a really interesting study, again by David Relman's group at Stanford, where he tracked the uh, fecal microbiota of uh, newborns over the first year of life and compared it to their parental uh, microbiota. And you can see here, and this is the uh, mean correlations, and you can see here that there's this reasonably high correlation in the first week of life, it drops off, and then as babies are in close contact, particularly with mums, that between three months and 12 months of age, they have 50% similarity in their microbiota to mums. Um, and dads, but mums especially. And you can see here, this is a very vulnerable time where things that we do to our kids or that, are, that happen to our kids uh, may be very impactful ultimately on their final microbiome development. So let's think about what are some of these things. Well, cesarean sections have become a worldwide phenomenon, so that could be a potential uh, risk to consider. And children born by C-section definitely do have different microbiota uh, in their uh, gut than children born by vaginal delivery who have more vaginal and fecal flora of their mom. Kids born by C-section have more skin flora. And those differences in flora can persist up up over months or even years, and it has been shown to have some association with atopic disease and asthma. So we had the ability to take a nested sample of our cohort and link them to their mothers through a registry number in Manitoba. And so we did a case control uh, study of persons with IBD dating back to 1970 up to 2010. Uh, compared to controls, and because we could identify their mothers, we could identify their siblings. So you don't need an advanced statistical degree to see that birth by C-section had no impact on whether somebody became an IBD case or was a control or a SIB. Now we weren't able to actually track uh, timing of breastfeeding, but we could track in this data set whether a mom initiated breastfeeding at discharge from hospital after giving birth, and you can see there was no difference between IBD cases and controls. However, I don't think we should look at breastfeeding in a binary way as yes or no. I think we need much more data on the, uh, whether breastfeeding is exclusive and the duration of breastfeeding and how that impacts on baby's microbiota. We also wanted to look at whether mom taking antibiotics was going to impact on ultimate outcome of babies changing their microbiota and therefore ultimately developing IBD. And we were able to look back at antibiotic use within nine months of delivery in mums, within 30 days and in hospital peripartum. And you can see here there is no difference between IBD cases and controls or between IBD cases and their siblings. So our data don't support the hypothesis that alterations in the gut microbiome in the days to weeks following delivery are critical for risk of IBD. But this in turn may imply that events happening later in childhood may be more important in altering the developing gut microbiome and enhancing the risk for the development of IBD. So what might some of these factors be? We've talked about antibiotics, but types of food and infections that occur to kids in the first year of life may also be important. So we went back to this data set and since 1979 we can actually track on all births in Manitoba, gestational age, APGAR score, neonatal ICU admission and birth weight. And I, these different categories of infection were extracted from our pediatricians who gave me the uh, 18 top reasons why kids are admitted with infection to hospital within the last three years in Manitoba. We presented these data at DDW last year and the paper is currently under review. And what you can see here is that infections within one year of age were significantly associated with diagnosing IBD at any age and being in the highest socioeconomic status at birth versus the lowest was also significantly associated with being diagnosed with IBD. But infections were particularly associated with being diagnosed with IBD um, under age 10, with an odds ratio of three, or under age 20. And it makes sense that what happens to us early in childhood may impact on our childhood presentation with disease and may have less of an impact on 40 and 50 year olds that present with IBD. We couldn't find any predictors in comparing to siblings. So we found that being in the highest socioeconomic status quintile at birth increased the risk for developing IBD, perhaps supporting the hygiene hypothesis,
And the significant predictor of being diagnosed with IBD by age 10 or age 20 was having an infection in the first year of life, which may reflect the use of antibiotics or alternatively, an effect of the actual clinical problem at a critical age for gut microbiome development. So our data don't support the hypothesis that alterations in the gut microbiome in the days to weeks following delivery are critical for risk for IBD, but events happening later in the first year of life may be more important in altering the developing gut microbiome and enhancing the risk for IBD. Now, just to say, in another paper by Suraday, we also found a consistent association between antibiotic dispensations two to five years prior to the onset of IBD in adult onset IBD. And Ryan Ungaro meta-analyzed this, and other than a paper from Italy, there were consistent uh, findings in adults, and this was the uh, aspect of the study where there was a 1.4, 40% increased risk. So that's antibiotic use some years before the onset of IBD in adults. Now, while I'm talking about the badness, potentially, of antibiotics, what about the goodness of probiotics? And certainly, all of our patients come to talk to us, or many of our patients, either on a probiotic or wanting to ask us about the use of probiotics. So here are the data on probiotics in IBD. E. coli Nisla, which is not available in Canada, is comparable in these clinical trials to um, inadequate doses of 5-ASA, um, so it has a comparable effect. And VSL number three has been shown to have some effect, uh, especially in that middle study. Um, VSL number three with 5-ASA was better than uh, placebo plus 5-ASA. However, when I speak to my uh, colleagues in the lab who use VSL number three in laboratory animal models of IBD, they are unable to consistently find the same organisms in VSL number three lots that they get. So I'm not sure about VSL number three. Now, other probiotics, and these are like the ones that most of our patients are on, bifidobacteria and lactobacilli, they don't seem to have had a positive impact in UC, and no role of these uh, probiotics in Crohn's disease. So when my patients um, ask me should they take a probiotic or they are taking a probiotic, I don't know if it has any risk for them, but I tell them I, d I know that it likely has no benefit. If they want to do it, they can do it. I think it likely has, it's not causing any harm, but it, they may be wasting money they could spend on other things. Now, undoubtedly, the number one question we get in our uh, clinical practices is what should I eat? What did I eat that may have triggered this? Or what should I eat now that I have this disease? And we do know that what we eat clearly impacts in our gut microbiome. And we used to think that our gut microbiota was like a fingerprint that you could alter it during a course of antibiotics, but it would come back to baseline. We have learned that if we dramatically change our diets, we can dramatically change our gut microbiota. So is the change in diet worldwide uh, a link to the global increase in IBD? There have been studies, there have been ecologic studies and some uh, case control studies uh, here showing that consumption of vegetables was protective in UC, not in Crohn's disease and interestingly not in Asia, and consumption of fruit was protective in UC and Crohn's disease. And fiber and carbohydrates has always been at the top of people's lists, thinking that there's these high fiber diets in places like Africa, and that's why they don't get Western diseases, and we've diminished our fiber intake, and we're eating a lot of refined sugar and simple sugars here in the West. And increased fiber certainly can increase the production of short-chain fatty acids, which can be um, a healthy environment, for instance, for the overgrowth of uh, potentially protective organisms like firmicutes. And in the nurse's health study, uh, the ingestion of fiber in the highest quintile led to a 40% reduction in Crohn's disease risk. Um, there wasn't a risk reduction seen with fiber intake and ulcerative colitis. So should we tell our patients to eat fiber? I remember the days when we used to tell our patients with Crohn's disease and strictures to not eat fiber because we were afraid they were going to obstruct. And we told our patients with ulcerative colitis who were active to not eat fiber because it was going to make their colons work harder. This is a meta-analysis and systematic review of fiber studies in IBD, and I should point out that while this is overall negative um, in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, these are not rigorous control trials, and these are not the kind of studies that have been discussed for the last two days with the biologic agents that we've seen. And so I am an advocate of my patients with IBD eating fiber, whether they have Crohn's disease or UC. Clearly, if they have strictures in Crohn's disease, you may not want them eating uh, raw asparagus that may get trapped in a stricture, but there's other ways to take in high-fiber diets.
Fat too has been looked at and it seems to be that there is an association with um, the intake of omega-6 fatty acids or, um, or uh, the polyunsaturated fatty acids uh, as opposed to omega-3 fatty acids. And that's been studied in the EPIC study, a different EPIC study that was led by Brian Fagan that doesn't translate to telling people to take fish oil or take the omega-3 fatty acids as a treatment. But the absence of omega-3 fatty acids or the reduction may be important as a risk. But here's where I think the real punchline is on diet. And it's not the macronutrients that we've all been uh, focused on, but it's these other elements in food that have emerged around the world. These uh, sp specific particles and emulsifiers that allow food to be processed and packaged and sold um, easily and not refrigerated and transported around the world. And actually in one of my favorite papers that I would encourage all of you to read uh, by Lerner and Matthias in Autoimmunity Reviews, they review the association between food additives and the emergence of uh, uh, what they're calling AD, autoimmune diseases, um, in different organ systems, and not only in different organ systems, but around the world. Um, these are the different types of food additives that one can see. It's not just emulsifiers. And the other thing about food additives, they also come with high fats in the processed food. And you can see that this is not just a North American phenomenon or a Western Hemisphere phenomenon, this is a worldwide phenomenon. And maybe, as was alluded to yesterday with the emergence of fast food, in these uh, countries, it's not just fast food. It's the food that are bought, bought in grocery stores around the world now. And I think that this is really an important area for study. And this is a really uh, cool paper that I found from Canadian data, which you can see here in the gray curve at the top is um, unprocessed or minimally processed food ingestion from the 1950s to 2011 and how that's dropped in Canada. And in the black line, the ultra-processed foods, the ready-to-consume uh, foods, how that has markedly increased uh, in Canada. And I'm sure that this mirrors what you're seeing in the United States. Um, it's the old story, when America um, sneezes, Canada catches a cold, so we like to do everything that you do except for now. So that leads us to consider what else do people ingest? And one of the thoughts about um, India, for instance, as a country that didn't have a lot of IBD 30 years ago, well, could it be, for instance, the curcumin in their, in, in their diet? Is this a spice that is having some protective effect? People have studied curcumin, and it does have some interesting immunomodulating effects. So this led, uh, about 10 years ago, to some studies looking at curcumin. This study was oral curcumin versus uh, 5-ASA in uh, ulcerative colitis that actually showed a significant beneficial effect at re reducing relapse rates. This study looked at curcumin enemas. And it's a little bit hard to placebo control curcumin, which is a yellow uh, product that has some uh, odor to it. But nonetheless, on intention to treat, there wasn't a difference. But on the per protocol analysis, there was a significant difference between those getting the curcumin enemas. And this was yet another curcumin enema uh, study that showed a clear benefit versus placebo, plus 5-ASA. Do I recommend my patients should ingest curcumin? I don't. I don't think it's bad if they're having a predominantly uh, Indian-style diet, but I don't want to deflect away from patients taking the real treatment that we've heard about for the last two days that's really important to help their disease. And in this interesting paper by Jeff Nguyen in Toronto, he looked at medication adherence to standard medical therapy in IBD in patients using complementary and alternative uh, medicines, we'll call them. And you can see here that complementary and alternative medication use in this uh, cohort was quite high at 70% in IBD and 82% in the general uh, public. But those patients who used uh, CAM with, in IBD were significantly uh, less likely to be adherent. They were half as likely to be adherent to their regular medications than people who were not using CAM. And so I think that this is a deflection. Many of our patients are using CAM, we, we know that. In a study that we published in gut a few years ago, many of our patients are using CAM, but not for their IBD. So if they're using CAM because they think it's just generally making them feel well and they understand that they need the regular therapy for their IBD, that's okay. I think we heard of a case somewhere, and I, I can't remember where in these last two days, of somebody who went off their medicine and went on their CBD oil. I can tell you with the legalization of marijuana in Canada two months ago, this is, I wouldn't say an epidemic, I don't want to overstate it, but this is a big thing. 
people are thinking that this is going to be a new wave and cool way to treat their uh, diseases. So finally, to close on um, mental health and whether this is an environmental issue that is uh, increasing the risk of IBD. The Manitoba IBD cohort study was a study of 380 people we followed uh, longitudinally every six months for 12 years with surveys and every year with an in-person interview. And at the outset, we asked people their perceptions of what caused their IBD, and 70% said it was stress or worry, 46% um, said it was diet. Now, in another study that we call the Living with, uh, Manitoba Living with IBD study, we presented some data recently at DDW from this study. We followed patients every two weeks. We followed 155 patients every two weeks with a lot electronic surveys. And when patients reported that they were flaring, we asked them what their perception was of their flare. 60% uh, again thought it was stress or worry that triggered their flare. And we have other data and other groups have data to show that there is a, a, a very strong association between a high perception of stress and flaring of symptomatic disease, but not necessarily inflammatory disease. Patients get symptoms uh, and they may get an increase in inflammatory disease. We don't know that as clearly. So IBD patients may have symptoms, they may have inflammation, and sometimes the symptoms and inflammation go together. And I think that we're all aware of this important brain-gut connection that is um, bilateral. The gut impacts on the brain and the brain impacts on the gut. And we know that biologically there's many different mechanisms through which stress can impact on the gut. In this interesting paper that John Walker and our group published from the Manitoba IBD cohort study, um, John showed that compared to population controls, IBD patients were significantly more likely to have a mood disorder several years prior to the onset of their IBD. Not just within that year, while they're symptomatic and it may be depressing them, but several years. And in a more recent uh, large cohort study that I'm doing together with Ruth Ann Mary, who's an expert MS epidemiologist, we're looking at MS IBD and rheumatoid arthritis in unison. We have a cohort of about 1,000 persons. And we're looking at psychiatric comorbidity and what we're calling IMIDS. The word IMIDS stands for immune-mediated inflammatory diseases on this slide. So you can see at the time of diagnosis, and these are administrative data, there's a bump in the diagnosis of depression and general anxiety disorder. Not a big surprise. That line stays uh, elevated above the general population post-diagnosis. But the interesting thing on this slide is to the left. Five years prior to the diagnosis of these chronic immune diseases, these patients have an increased prevalence of psychiatric uh, diagnoses. And so I think our psychiatrists have lagged behind us in understanding the basic biology of their diseases, but there may be some important intersection that leads to an increased risk for IBD. Okay. So to close off uh, this session and what do I recommend? What do I tell my patients, which was the, it's taken me 20 minutes to get here, 30 minutes to get here. Miguel, I'm sorry, but this was what I was supposed to talk about. What do I recommend to patients and to physicians who are treating patients? Well, I recommend no smoking, and that's true. And Steve, close your ears. That's true for my UC patients as well, because just smoking is bad, and there's got to be other ways that we can make people better. I don't no, and I don't believe necessarily that smoking is a cause for IBD because it doesn't seem to be a, an association in the developing world. I do recommend judicious, judicious use of antibiotics, and I recommend that uh, for many reasons, not least of which is the epidemic of C. difficile, but perhaps the impact it may have on IBD. Probiotics don't help. I don't know if they hurt, but I'm certainly not an advocate. I don't think we should behave like doctors who give antibiotic prescriptions to get patients out of the office. I don't think we should tell our patients who have some symptoms, oh, why don't you take a probiotic? You know, that can't hurt. I don't do that. I think that patients should have a high fiber, high fruit, high vegetable diet, even once they're diagnosed. And I tell them to eat everything that they can tolerate. Of course, less processed food is better for all of us and natural foods are better. I don't advocate for CAM products. The evidence is not robust that any help. And in fact, we start to see signals that some help, and then they go away. Uh, Andrographia was one that our friend Bill Sanborn led a study on, looked very promising. It's kind of dwindled away. So I think we really need strong evidence that things work before we start just telling people to adopt them. And I think we should inquire about stress and mental health. 
and we should intervene. And as Millie alluded to, we may not be able to intervene, but we need to have a friend that we can access who can intervene for us. So, um, what are our action plans to help us understand IBD? What research uh, endeavors should we be undertaking? Well, I think we need to understand what are children eating in the first year of life. I think we need to understand what role exclusive breastfeeding has versus a mix of breastfeeding and table diets and to what extent this has changed in the last 30 years. Um, we need to understand how much food additives kids are getting in. What is the trajectory of use of antibiotics in the first year of life? What types of antibiotics are used? How many repeated courses there are? And this is true both in kids and adults. And what may confound this is the availability of antibiotics without prescriptions in some of the countries we're most interested in. I think we need to do more work with the food industry. We already know of the rise of Western fast food, but to what extent are Westerners and Easterners eating non-natural packaged foods at home? What is the rate of psychiatric comorbidity antedating IBD in emerging IBD countries? Does it change the outcomes? We know of data from the West that it does. And does treating psychiatric comorbidity change the outcomes? We don't have that data. But I'll tell you that the epidemiologic data from India say that India has the highest rates of depression and suicide in the world. How that may tie into their emergence of IBD? Not sure. We, we really need to study emerging IBD countries and their immigrants to the West. So Indians living in India we need to study, but Indians living in North America who especially are the first generation offspring of their parents who moved here and have lived in our milieu, I think are very ripe for study. And finally, we should be studying multiplex IBD families and not just look at these three relatives that have got IBD, we really need to study their unaffected relatives to understand what they didn't experience that protected them from IBD. And with that, I will stop.